So areas of difficulty, um, I'm going to talk about four things. I'm actually going to talk about five. And I'm going to go faster than I would like, given the time. So applying these principles and ethical frameworks can be hard. I've seen challenges in these uh, four different areas. Um, so what I want to do is I want to try to give you a simple idea about each of these areas. And then I want to give you a counterexample. And then hopefully give you a better idea and then give some advice at the end. So I want to try to hopefully give you an example that breaks the way you think about the problem now and then try to rebuild the way you think about it in a different way. So informed consent. So I think the simple idea that people have is informed consent from all participants at all times. Uh, and I think this is wrong. I'll give you an example. This was a study by uh, my former colleague, Diva Pager. Uh, about the mark of a criminal record. So sociologists may be very familiar with this study. Uh, what she did is she uh, had actors uh, go and apply for jobs. Uh, some of the actors were white and some were black. Uh, some of them had a criminal record on their fake resume and some did not. And she found that um, uh, white people were called back at much higher rates than black people, and that uh, people with a criminal record were called back at much lower rates than people without a criminal record. Uh, she also found that a white person with a criminal record was more likely to be called black than a black person without a criminal record, which is very disturbing. Um, not wholly statistical significant, but if she had had more people, I think that's what she would have found. Um, so this is an experiment. Um, and did this experiment have the consent of the participants? No. The participants were not the actors. They obviously knew what was happening. It was the employers. And in fact, there have been field experiments to dis study discrimination like this, at least 117 studies published in 17 countries. So here we have a study that does not have consent and that's being widely used. So why is that? So people who do this kind of research make four arguments for why the lack of consent is appropriate here. First is the limited harm to employers. They say it's not a huge burden that we're placing on the employers. There is a great social benefit to having reliable measures of discrimination. The weaknesses of other methods for measuring discrimination. So we all know that this is very hard to do with observational data. And this fourth one, I think, is important. The fact that deception does not strongly violate the norms of that setting. So I want to explain this a little bit more. The other three, I think, you, can, you probably have seen or thought about before. This is the idea that when we do deception, we're not just potentially harming the participants. We're also potentially harming the context in which that research takes place. So one example where this came up in the US is uh, in the US, a lot of criminal cases are decided by juries, which is just sort of 12 randomly sampled people, hear the case, and then discuss it and decide. Uh, and these researchers wanted to uh, record jury deliberations to understand what actually happened. Like These are very high stakes decisions. And like people don't understand what juries do. So they got permission from the judge and the lawyers in a case to secretly record the jury. And then it eventually came out, and this was a scandal. And then Congress passed a law that you're not allowed to record juries. And the idea is that they want to protect the context of jury deliberation as a safe place to say what you want. Another example, maybe, let's imagine you were interested in doing um, research about doctors and patients interacting with each other. And then let's imagine you started having doctors lie to patients, right? Like that would not just harm those patients. That would potentially, imagine if every time you went into a doctor's office, you were like, oh, am I in a study now? Like, do I need to, right? That would be really, really bad. So you have to think about not just the harm to the specific people, but the harm to the context. And they argue that employment is a context where deception is not uncommon. Uh, so that's a principles-based argument for doing this. A rules-based argument is that dozens of IRBs have approved this, probably based on section 46.11 part D of the, uh, the regulations 
which specifically has to do with when you can delay or remove consent. There's a specific part in the rules about this. Uh, and US courts have also upheld the lack of consent and deception in field experiments to measure discrimination. So that particular case, courts have decided that this is appropriate. And so there's this simple idea that informed consent for everything, and the actual rules and principles are some uh, form of consent for most research, which is a much more complicated thing to do, but I think is a more accurate way of thinking about how we should be doing it. Um, so uh, when you think about consent, again, think about whether it's res about respect for persons or beneficence. So in Encore, for example, the major thing about consent, I think, in that study was about making sure that people who would be put a lot at risk for, for triggering these measurements of potentially censored websites would have the ability to opt out. It was less about their respecting their autonomy as people. Um, and then there are more ideas for alternatives to informed consent in section 6.6.1 of bit by bit. So that's a little bit about informed consent. A lot of problems arise around informed consent. Another is understanding and managing informational risk. So the biggest risk in most comp computational social science is informational risk, the disclosure, that, like the disclosure of personal information. So the harms from this could be economic, social, psychological, or criminal. So some of us have data on our computers that could cause people to go to jail. Like, let's just think for a minute about the seriousness of that and the responsibility that comes with that. OK, so the simple idea in this setting is that data can be made anonymous and that we can tell what data is sensitive or not. And what I want to argue is that both of those are wrong. So I want to first argue that anonymizing data is not actually doing what you might think it is doing. So let me, so when I talk about anonymization, I'm going to put it in quotes because it's like not actually that thing. Um, so this is uh, an example from a study by Latanya Sweeney. So this was a setting where the state of Massachusetts wanted to make uh, medical records available to researchers. They had very good intentions. Uh, they took off the name, home address uh, of the medical records, and then they made all of this information available to researchers. Then what happened was Latanya Sweeney got a bunch of voting records, which also shared some fields in the medical records, and then they, she merged them together. And now she has name and ho home address, along with the supposedly anonymous medical records. Uh, so she fortunately had good intentions, so she took the governor's medical records, she found the governor's medical records, and sent them to him personally, uh, at which point he got this data taken away. <laughs> um, so it's a great story. She had good intentions. There are lots of people who are potentially doing stuff like this with bad intentions, or I would say without strong intentions at all. The intentions are really about enabling commerce. A lot of this kind of merging is not by people meaning to do harm, but it can be used to do harm. So the, this attack illustrates a kind of principle that a lot of these attacks take, which is that you have two things that are safe, and you combine them, and you get something that's unsafe. So I like to think about it as like baking soda and vinegar. And if you put them together, you get this volcano. And so. If you have baking soda and you release it, it's very hard for you to know that there is not somewhere else out in the world, either today or in the future, vinegar. And so when you are releasing data, you're essentially making a statement about what else you think is out there that can be combined with your data, not just today, but in the future as well. So this can be very tricky, and a lot of well-meaning people have misunderstood this problem. Um, so the simple idea, data can be made anonymous and we can tell what's sensitive. A better is that all data are potentially identifiable and all data are potentially sensitive. I haven't really made the case for this second thing yet, but I will right now. So this is a paper about re-identifying the Netflix data set. So you may have heard about the Netflix challenge where Netflix released a bunch of movie rating data. You may have also heard 
that researchers were able to re-identify people in this data set, even though it had nothing about the people. All it had was a list of their movie ratings. And so basically the way the attack worked is you get other movie rating data that has people's names on it and you merge them together. And so then you get to see all the ratings they've made publicly as well as the ratings they made to Netflix that they did not make publicly. Um, now you may think, well, maybe I can like randomly perturb my data and change it around so that it's harder to do this kind of merge. It turns out one of the things this paper shows is that that is not possible. So as data sets, that is not in general easy, let me clarify. So as data sets get larger and larger, uh, in terms of more and more information about each person, they get more and more sparse in the sense that uh, all the points get further away from each other. And so if you randomly move a point around a little bit, um, then the closest point to the, that moved point is still the original point. So that argument is made much more precise in this paper. But let me just, so the, the idea of adding noise may work OK in a low dimensional setting, but in a high dimensional setting, it does not work as well. And this paper explains why. Um, so you may say, oh, big deal, like movie ratings, no big deal. Um, so this was a lawsuit that was filed against Netflix by some of the people whose movie ratings were exposed. And I just want to read to you briefly from this lawsuit. Uh, movie and rating data contain information of a more highly personal and sensitive nature. The member's movie data exposes a Netflix member's personal interests and or struggles with various highly personal issues including sexuality, mental illness, recovery from alcoholism, and victimization from incest, physical abuse, domestic violence, adultery, and rape. So it may be true that for you personally, your Netflix data is not a big deal. And in that case, awesome. Please, you can post your Netflix data for everyone. Um, however, in a very, very, very large data set, there are likely to be some people in that data set for whom that data is sensitive. And it may be very hard for you to know this ahead of time. And so this is just a real problem with deciding what is sensitive. So we may think, oh, health data is sensitive. Financial data is sensitive. But it seems that really all data is sensitive, at least for some people. And it's very, it seems to be very hard to anticipate. So how should we deal with this? So I think there's one thing I like is called this the five safes data protection plan. So computer scientists have developed a number of technical ways of trying to deal with this. Those have um, very great promise, but are hard to deploy and practice in a lot of situations. The five safes thing is a way of developing a strong data protection plan. So you want safe projects, means what you're doing should be safe. Uh, safe people, so you restrict who has access. Safe data means you don't store more than you need, and you strip out the stuff that you don't need. Safe setting means like the physical setting where it's happening. And safe outputs means you don't release information that could then be used to re-identify. So there's a, an example where someone like released a point map of a disease outbreak. But then you're able to go and see who had the disease. So that output was not a safe output. Um, so I think with a strong data protection plan, most computational social science is minimal risk. So minimal risk is a term that uh, IRBs in the US use, which is benchmarking the level of risk to a in a study to the amount of risk that happens in everyday life. So there's more ideas in 6.6.2 of bit by bit. I think one other thing, if you want to get data from a company or a government, like many of you, some of you have probably tried that and some of you have probably found that frustrating. I think having a strong data protection plan is one way to help your cause. So they are very worried that if they give you the data, bad stuff will happen. That is one of their many worries. Uh, but if you can put forward a strong data protection plan, that shows that you are a responsible researcher and can help you progress further in these discussions. Privacy. So when I was working on bit by bit, I thought, OK, great. I'm going to write about privacy. I'm just going to like re, you know, find the definition of privacy and then write that. And that turned out to be really complicated. Uh, so privacy, what is privacy? I, don't, I still don't know. No one really, there's no general agreed upon definition. 
I think, though, in the research ethics tradition, there is this idea that there is public data and there is private data. And if the data is public, you can kind of do whatever you want. And if the data is not public, then you have a lot more rules to follow. And I think this public-private dichotomy maybe made sense in 1970. It doesn't really make sense today. Uh, I want to give you an example. This is from a paper uh, about voting. So what these researchers did is they took out an ad in the newspaper that said the following. Uh, who votes is public information. Dear registered voter, uh, on November 6, 2007, an election to select local leaders will be held in Eli, Iowa. As a registered voter, you are eligible to vote in this election. We urge you to exercise your civic duty and vote on November 6. We also remind you that who votes is a matter of public record. To promote participation in the election, we will obtain a complete list of registered voters who cast ballots on election day from the local election officials. Shortly after the election, we will publish this in a local newspaper so that all members of your town can see who voted and who did not vote. OK. Oh, sorry, this is who, who did not vote. They will only publish who did not vote. So it is true in the US, uh, because of the way our elections work, whether you actually vote or not is public record. It, who you vote for is not public record, but whether you vote or not is public record. And so you might say, well, this data is public. This data is public. You can go to the courthouse and get a list of all the people that voted. Um, but taking that and publishing it in the newspaper is probably not what these people expected, especially having a researcher who is not from Iowa come there and do this is probably not what the people in this town intended. So even though this data is public, something feels a little weird about this. And so I think a better way to think about this is this idea of contextual integrity, which was developed by a philosopher named Helen Nissenbaum, among others. And the idea is you want to think about the flows of information. And so I think that will help articulate why this particular study is unsettling to us. Uh, so in contextual integrity, the key idea are these context relative informational norms. So basically norms about how information flows. And so Nissenbaum argues to think about that, you need to think about who are the actors involved what are the attributes, what type of information, and what are the transmission principles? So she argues that if you think about these three dimensions, and that will help you figure out what the norms are in that setting, and that will help you think about if what you're doing will be considered creepy. Uh, and so she argues that just focusing on two of these is not enough. A lot of the other theories of public and private don't think always as much about all three. So if you have like something that's three-dimensional and you only look at two of the dimensions, you can get weird cases. So she argues if you look at all three of these dimensions, then you, the weird cases go away. Um, so in this particular case, the transmission principles, people thought they're giving this information about whether they vote to the government. I don't know why they, the government has it, but they do. And then they were not expecting it to end up in having someone not from their town or government put it into the newspaper. So a uh, fourth problem uh, is making decisions in the face of uncertainty. So a lot of times you will have this problem that you won't know what are, you won't be able to know the risks and benefits or how people will think about it or all of these things when you have to decide. You will often be in the situation where you will have to decide without having all the information you would like. And so what are some ways to think about that? So sometimes people have this idea that's called better safe than sorry. It's sometimes called the precautionary principle. Um, and the idea is basically, if it could go wrong, let's not do it. And I want to argue that sounds like a very wise and prudent thing to do, but I want to argue that's not really very wise and prudent. This is a recipe for not doing anything. Uh, which And not doing anything is often not wise and not prudent. Um, so uh, let's imagine uh, a study like emotional contagion. Not emotional contagion, but something like it. So someone might be harmed by the experiment. Uh, it's also true that someone might be harmed if the experiment is not performed. So the researchers who were doing this, they said uh, afterwards that like one of their things they were interested in is how the content of people's newsfeed affects their emotions. 
So there are people now who believe that spending time on Facebook is not good for your mental health. Some people argue that. And so you could imagine that they, the people at Facebook had a responsibility to try to understand the effect of their product on people. And controlling the emotional valence of the newsfeed is something they can do. They are doing it either explicitly or implicitly. I think probably they're doing it implicitly. They've set the knobs. They have that very complicated algorithm. There's a bunch of knobs. There's probably not a knob that says happy, sad. But all those other knobs probably set the happy, sad knob. So that's a lot of responsibility. So maybe they should be figuring out what effect it has on people. So in other words, just the fact that someone could be harmed by doing the experiment is true. The fact that also someone could be harmed by not doing the experiment is also true. So there is no risk-free way. If someone says, oh, there's a risk, we shouldn't do it, you also have to flip that around and say, what's the risk of not doing anything? So a better idea is there is no risk-free approach, and we should avoid a narrow field of view. There's a whole book elaborating that idea by Cass Sunstein that I think is really helpful if you run into this excessively precautionary principle approach. Um, so what are some ways forward if you are dealing with making decisions under uncertainty? One is the minimal risk standard, which I mentioned very briefly. The main idea is you might not know how big the risk of, let's say, emotional contagion is. That, like, what's the risk of blocking positive feed, uh, messages from people's newsfeed? Like, that's a very hard thing to measure. But you might say, well, let's just try to benchmark that to whatever is already happening on Facebook naturally occurring. And so you might say, well, I think this kind of small change in people's newsfeed is probably not that different than what occurs naturally on people's news feeds on Facebook. And so maybe there's not any additional risk beyond what people are experiencing already. Or maybe there is, I don't know. But again, you, instead of trying to estimate it accurately, you try to compare it to some other standard, and often that's easier. Uh, a second way forward is to do a power analysis. So often people are taught to do power analysis to make sure their studies are big enough. Here, I think now we also need to do power analysis to make sure our studies are no bigger than they need to be, or as small as possible. Um, because again, if the risks are unknown, we don't want to expose people to that risk unnecessarily, and even if that risk is small for each person. So one of the arguments you often hear in these online platforms is like, oh, if we can do this, increase this by like from 1% to like 1.1%, that'll be a huge benefit to society because so many people will benefit. The exact same argument also applies to these risks. Like a small increment in risk spread over 2 billion people is a big increment in risk, right? So the exact same reasoning has to apply, which means we should want to make our experiments as small as possible, but no smaller, right? We don't want to do an experiment that's too small that we can't learn from it. Um, another thing you can do is ethical response surveys. So these are basically short surveys that you can give to people to get their assessments of uh, how they would respond to particular study designs. One thing I like about this is you can create like 10 different versions of a study and get some feedback from lots of different people about how they would respond to it. This is one thing you can do potentially when informed consent is difficult. Um, it's ambiguous what you do with the responses to those surveys, but I think as a tool for helping you think through what to do, it's a useful approach. Uh, and then staged trials. So this is a very good idea from uh, drug research. So they don't, like, let's imagine, like, Chris is a drug researcher, and he comes up with this new thing. And then we're like, great, we're going to roll out a big RCT with a million patients. That's not how it works. Like, they have uh, a stage one trial where they try to find a safe dose. And then they have a stage two trial where they try to show any kind of positive effect. I'm, I'm messing up a little bit the stages, I think. And then only then do you go to a stage three trial, which is the kind that we think of as a drug trial. And so if you have uncertainty, just go through this stage trial to make sure what you're doing is safe and has a chance to be effective. Um, so those are four areas of difficulty that I think many of you have faced or will face. I hope these ideas are somewhat helpful. I want to talk about a fifth area of difficulty that's come up more recently for me. It's not in the book. It's a new one that I encounter more and more.
it's these unanticipated secondary uses. So now we are in the we have the capability to create tools that can be used, general purpose tools that can be used for lots of things. Um, and so that can like some of that stuff get can get used in ways that we don't want. And I don't really know how to think about this. I guess one way I like to think about it is like a hammer. So you can use a hammer to build a house and you can use a hammer to break a house. Right? Hammers have very destructive and constructive uses. The good thing about a hammer, though, is it's designed to promote the constructive use and not so much to promote the destructive use. And so even if your research has these kind of dual capabilities, try to think about how you can make it as much as possible for the good thing and make it as hard as possible to misuse it for the bad thing. That's not a very precise thing. Uh, but I want to give one example of this kind of thing. So this is a project um, um, called eBird. It's done by ornithologists at Cornell. And it's designed to create a big database, citizen science database of bird behavior data. So there's l people who love going out and looking at birds. And they write down all the birds they see. And then they can upload them to this database. And this allows these ornithologists to study the patterns of bird migration all over the world. It's a great idea. It's really wonderful. How could this go wrong? Basically, poachers and other people who had bad intentions were going on and finding where certain birds were and then going there to capture them. So now they have to have a sensitive species policy in eBird where they block information about certain species. So I think this is actually, these eBird people, they love birds. Everything I can tell about them, they just love birds. <laughs> they had no desire at all to help birds get poached. But when they created this system, it had this unanticipated effect. And in the future, I think as researchers, we're going to have to get better at anticipating those things. Because it is getting harder and harder to say, oh, I just didn't think of that. I'm really sorry. Like, that we, we can do better than that. Um, so one way I like to think about this is how would Lex Luthor use this? So Lex Luthor, he's an evil supervillain uh, in, in the Superman. Uh, universe. So he's all powerful and all evil. <clears throat> and then I like to think, what would someone like that do with the kinds of things I'm creating? You can't totally design against a Lex Luthor, but as a thought experiment, I find it to be very helpful. And more generally, it requires adversarial thinking, thinking about how people who want to do bad things will react with what you're doing. Computer security researchers have developed this tradition a lot. I think it's a very good tradition. We don't practice this in social science, but I think increasingly as we build these systems into the world, we need to start bringing in more adversarial thinking. Um, so a uh, little bit of practical advice at the end. Think about the IRB as a floor and not a ceiling. So the IRB, you, if you are subject to an IRB, you should probably follow that IRB. <coughs> um, but that's not the end. That's just the beginning. And you should be able to do more than the IRB because you actually know much more than the IRB. about your, No one knows more about your work than you. And so you are in the best position to find the right, minimize the risks and maximize the benefits much more than the IRB is. Um, put yourself in everyone's shoes, not just your own shoes, thinking about how cool this paper is going to be, uh, and not just the shoes of your friends who also think about how cool papers are. Like Really get a wide field of view. Um, that will often help with a lot of these problems. And then the last thing is thinking about research ethics as continuous and not discrete. So often I hear people say, oh, that's ethical, that's unethical. And like this very binary thinking, it is like, it makes everything very emotional and it actually shuts down a lot of conversation because it's like, oh, that's unethical. Then you like can't have a conversation about it. It's like over. So like think about how you could say like, oh, that study could be more ethical if they did this. And then that thinking about that also requires you to think about your own work in a different way too because no matter where your work is on the line of ethical or unethical, it could be more ethical, right? It could be better. Everyone's work can be better in every dimension. Uh, and so thinking of these things as continuous, I think, helps for conversation, helps us try to make our work better as well. <clears throat>
and then think about ethics as a research opportunity. Oftentimes people think of ethics as a burden, like, oh, I have to be worried about ethics. But like, there's an entire field about fairness, accountability, and transparency in computer science that's all about how we can develop more ethical methods, which I think is great. And I think social scientists could increasingly think about ethics as a research opportunity. So the next step is you all will do case studies. Um, and we'll do that after lunch. So what we'll do now is we'll break for lunch. Then the live stream will go off. Then after lunch, I will briefly introduce the group activities with some slides. People at the partner locations, your local host, can introduce the activities with the slides that are up on the website. And uh, then we'll have a chance to talk about these issues. And then we'll come back and we'll hear Alondra Nelson. So, uh, with that, thank you, and let's have lunch.